Welcome to episode 112 of the Civil War Breakfast Club. <laughs> oh my God. I was not expecting that. You were saying? Lick bow the llama. <laughs> anyway, okay, take two. And yeah, this is why. The, oh my God. People on, on YouTube are in for a um, oh, yeah. real but treat tonight when they when they see this. <laughs> anyway, okay. Welcome to episode 112 of the Civil War Breakfast Club podcast. Tonight, I am joined by my super awesome Civil War nerd co-host, Darren. I am just merely his Canadian co-host, Mary. I don't have a creative bone in my body, so like when it comes to the intro, so there. Oh, that was that would. I'm, eventually I'm it's going eventually it was, like, it was that i mean honestly sometimes i think i'm you know just doing it so badly because i just want you to say like okay you know what from now on i'm just going to do the intro because it's easier to which i would be oh, like 100 percent okay with i really would anyways okay because well, i'm sure if we a, did a, a great a, i'm sure if we did a poll amongst our listeners they would say that they prefer your intros over mine because oh, i are... don't think so at all i don't think so at all but anyway how are you what's going on i'm good how are you yeah, well, I, I'm stunned. I'm speechless up that fantastic intro. We're here on a hot and steamy, sticky Thursday night here in Plymouth, Massachusetts. Thunderstorms are afoot all around the neighborhood. Yes, they are just north of us in AF, Boston. As they say. Yeah. But we're going to get through it. We're going to muscle through it. We're going to have a good time. So um, what you going to ask me? I was about to get to that. Thank you very much. You what weren't. are you drinking tonight? Yes, I was. Well, I'm drinking. It's called The Crisp from Six Points um, out of Brooklyn because part of this episode we're going to talk about has to do with brooklyn sort of i don't have any new york mugs so i have my proud boston red sox mug because this is what the best i can do right? stick it to new york and yeah. hey, whatever case it's okay anyway so yeah what's happening what are you drinking uh so i'm drinking bengal which is or bengali i think it's called which is also at a six point brewing in new york and honestly like we did not plan that for tonight when we bought that beer last week and we had some left over like we did not plan for it to be new york beer specifically for this podcast but that's the way it worked out and i'm not going to show my mug on here but it is a civil war mug um not sure if there's new york regiments in it but i just grabbed the first civil war mug i saw so that's what i'm drinking uh -huh. but yes as you yeah, said tonight uh -huh. we are going to be talking about it's it's honestly a subject that um i mean for my studying the civil war does not get talked about um i don't think nearly enough it's almost like people don't really want to touch it but i mean i have to say my introduction to the new york city draft riots was through one of my favorite movies gangs of new york which in my opinion is a civil war movie but it shows the home front side of it it shows and i mean yes it's not again it's not completely historically accurate but it's still a good movie but that was my introduction to it when that movie came out like many years ago and i was like whoa i really didn't know that had happened but it's oh, yeah, such a spent, fascinating part of the civil it, war. It is. We spend a lot of time talking about battles and generals and in people who make up this cast of characters in this crazy civil American civil war we do. But one aspect, like you said, we really haven't talked to too much about was the impact of the war, mm -hmm. you know, on the home front, you know, the, yeah. the damage that, that has been done to the citizens and its cities. Now, you know, we mentioned diaries like Mary Chestnut's diary, you know, here and there. We've never never really got into the plight of the civilians in the city. So today we are going to talk about one of the darkest hours in the entire Civil War history. And, and it has nothing to do with battle formations or strategy. You know, this is this is, you know, this was the draft riots that took place in New York City in July of 1863. The riot or insurrection will actually be the second largest insurrection in American history, of course, after what? After the Civil War, right? Yep. And what it's going to do, it's going to tear apart the city of New York and to the point where that the, its fingerprints of this riot are still there today. Yeah, they're, they're, they're still, in how, still there. in how the city's divided and all that. And I think, too, the, the thing about the, the New York City draft riots is not only, as you said, is it showing kind of this home front side of the Civil War that doesn't really get talked about a lot, but it also shows like it's a city in the north that is clearly divided over how it feels things are going with the Civil War. And I mean, in New York, you do have there is a Copperhead movement there. And I mean, I don't know. I want to try and explain what a Copperhead is. It is really like, you know, it's basically somebody that doesn't support the Civil War, but they're a northerner. Um, yeah, they're basically they, peace, yeah. peace Democrats. The thing, the thing with the draft riot, though. 
is, I don't know about you, but for me, it was not taught in any school I went to. No. You know, I, I never learned really much about it till later, but it's, it's important to understand not just what happens, but why it happens. And, and, and what is said about what it's said about racism in the North, a concept mm-hmm. that is usually reserved for the South, I mean, yeah. Italy and in popular whatever theory. But again, you, when you look at this and setting up the whole thing, uh, much of this goes into how the whole thing came about, you know, leading up to the Civil War in the 1850s, New York's economy was very heavily tied to the South, more mm-hmm. so than any other northern city. Now, New York was a major importer of Southern cotton, which is which is basically was sent to wealthy manufacturers. Right. And a huge part of why New York was such a large manufacturing city was the influx of what the immigrants. Right. Yeah. That flooded the city. Throughout the 19th century, now, if you look at some of the statistics in the census of New York City, they show that in 1830, 98% of New York's population was natural born. Yep. In the 1850s, over 140,000 immigrants came into New York City, and the city's population swelled to over 800,000. The population of foreign-born residents doubled in the 1850s. So when you jump ahead to the 1960 census, when you look at these numbers, of New York City's immigrants were Irish, 33% were German. Nationally, 90% of immigrants who came into the United States in the 1850s, they came to the North because of why? Mm -hmm. Because the slave labor that was in the South made competition for jobs just about impossible. And that's an important part of that we're going to talk about with these riots is the the job situation. As you said, that, you know, they're coming here to the North because there's more opportunity for them for jobs because in the south you know because of the slave economy there's not those same job opportunities there right and and the immigrants they did a lot of what we call those grunt jobs today right they they worked on the docks unloading cotton from ships they did construction they worked at the dairy queen they did all (laughs) those labor intensive jobs that that was what they did so new york also had a large and growing african-american population now, when New York sta- uh, abolished slavery in 1827, the black population swelled with those emancipated slaves who also worked at those grunt jobs, right? Mm-hmm. Now, groups such as the African Dorcas Association, which was led by, a bl- by black women, they wanted to make sure black children in the city were educated. And, they, and so it was founded in the 1830s to help integration. Right. Kind of like an early Freedmen's Bureau type. Yeah, that's exactly what I was saying. In the city. Yeah. Right. Yeah. But by the 1850s, tension between the blacks and these immigrants, mostly the Irish in Italy, mm-hmm. was growing due to that competition of the jobs you mentioned for that labor. And it's what it did is it started to flare up between these two groups. Now, what happens is you mentioned gangs in New York. Right. Yeah. Gangs started to pop up in New York City at the time such as the Irish dead rabbits, right? Yeah, right. Which is the one from Gangs in New York and the plug plug uglies. Um, I'm trying to remember what Daniel Day-Lewis's gang was called. I think it was the, was it the natives? Something Um, like that. I don't remember, to be honest, but- I need to watch that movie again. But but these gangs and these attacks on black laborers started to occur. 1857, the dead rabbit riot happens. That's what it it was. Mm -hmm. And it occurred, it it led to eight deaths uh, in, in- Basically, it took the New York militia to put it down. So, you know, one of our, when he, Daniel Day was one of his, one of his favorite movies, does a really good job kind of explaining that. And if you watch the, the movie, you'll notice the last scene, or one of the last scenes is from what? The New York riot. Yeah. Is how it's right, right that, in the movie. Yeah. Like I said at the beginning, that that's how I learned about these riots. Um, I had just, you know, I was so focused on the battles in my Civil War studies that I never you know, I was like, whoa, I had, you know, no idea, you know, this is happening on the home front and how bad it was. And just to like the impact that it, you know, you can still kind of see today in the city with the the divisions that are still no, there. No question. And it gets worse. September of 1862, the guy with the hat, we talk about Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. He is going to write that Emancipation Proclamation, which will go into effect on January 1st, 1863. The Irish population in New York City, Mary, they were not the happy about this one bit. They no. were like you and I tell you to slow it down and mix in a water once in a while. That look, uh, that's how no. angry they were. They were they were pretty mad because there's already a, t- a lot of tension for that yeah. job competition. But the potential of thousands of more emancipated blacks now invading New York to take the jobs 
was an issue that directly affected them. And it increased that temperature in the city. So those racial flames in New York City were also being fanned by the local politicians and newspapers yes. in the city. Now, which catered to the Irish because mm -hmm. guess why? They could speak English. The Germans couldn't. So they put yeah. a lot of this inflammatory language in the newspapers. New York City was led by a Democrat slash Copperhead mayor by name Fernando Woodmary. Yes, who he came up in our episode about Oliver Otis Howard. And he, he is a um, he's the character that I love to hate in the Lincoln movie. Lee Pace plays him, does a terrific job of playing Fernando Wood. But yeah, as you said, he's the mayor of New York City. And the one thing he does is he tries to get this movement going to get New York City to secede from the Union. Like this is well, he, how he, much of a he does. head he is. He, he well, he, it was more economic, is why yeah. he did it. But 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 for the most part, you know, he was he, he was a Southern sympathizer. He was a uh, he was a classic comrade. He was recently elected to his second term in 1860, thanks to the support from those Irish immigrants, mm. especially the dead rabbits who helped push him his his support. Now, Wood was a piece of work. He just was. He was a Philly native. This probably explains why he's so angry <laughs> all the time. And he's going to get married three times and have 16 children in his life. So this oh guy, my God. This, this guy had, I don't know how he had time to do anything besides politics, you know, put his pants <laughs> on once in a while. But, but he, but that's what that's what he was. Now, Fernando Wood was was also, like you mentioned, he famously approached the city's alderman in 1861, demanding New York City secede from the union and become what was called a free city. Mm -hmm. Now, that primary reason we talked about, like I said earlier, was that New York's economy was directly tied importing southern cotton. 50% of New York's exports were uh, exports were full or in part to Southern cotton. So the Civil War directly hurt the city's pocketbook, mm -hmm. and especially Tammany Hall's Democratic politi political machine, yeah. because that cotton fed the money, which fed the Democrats, which, which that's it all, all in hands yeah. in hands. So what Wood does, he is it, obviously he's going to try to see, it's, it's not going to get shot down, obviously. Yeah. Um, there'd be no New York Yankees today. Basically. <laughs> Think about God. that, how that would change history, right? But again, Wood appeals directly to those immigrants for their support and their votes. What he basically tells them is this. New York City should take care of its own working class instead of worrying about the working class from people in other states. That's what he's telling them. And they're like, yeah, yeah. And they're buying into this. He's continually going to tell them that abolition is going to add thousands of freed slaves to the already competitive New York City workforce, mm -hmm. which is being strangled. Due to the war, the city's already being strangled because of the cotton embargoes. Now those jobs that are already gone are going to get even more competitive with, with that. That's how he's, feed, he's feeding them. He's scaring them. It's fear tactics, right? So the tent that the immigrants are already poor, you know, they're living in slums. And now Lincoln's Emancipation Proclamation is really their worst nightmare. It yeah. really, really is, if you think about it. And tensions are going to often lead to violence. March of 1863, white immigrant dock workers are going to attack 200 black laborers and their families. So you're going to have it's this perfect growing storm, right? In a nutshell, summer of 1863, New York City was a power cake. It was of racial and economic tensions. It was being fueled by the democratically controlled newspapers and politicians mm -hmm. filming the, fill, filling the immigrants' heads full of fear and putting abolitionists in blacks uh, as their direct enemies and putting a crosshair right on their backs, what he's doing, right? Yeah. That match is going to ignite the powder keg. And that is going to come from the passing of the Enrollment Act, also known as the Civil War Military Draft Act. Yeah. If you're nasty, it was passed on March 3rd of 1863. The Enrollment Act was the first national conscription law and required every male citizen and, and, and immigrant who filed for citizenship between the ages of 20 and 45 to be eligible to be drafted into the Union Army. That's what it said. Mm -hmm. e if you remember, each state has a quota system. Yeah. You know, the state doesn't meet the quota, it falls to the draft. So they're still trying to focus on volunteers. They're still trying to recruit. And I think, right. you know, the thinking behind like Lincoln and the administration putting this into place is that they thought that it was going to speed up volunteers. It was like, oh, if I don't volunteer, I'm going to get drafted. Well, I mean, at this point in the Civil War, I don't think it would have worked anyway. Like, no, it, it and it's going to prove to fail. But the, the problem was, is the, the 
the one of the biggest errors in the actual act was the back door Lincoln put into this. Yes. Now you talk about you know Creedence Clearwater uh, Revival, right? Mm -hmm. The song Fortunate Son, they song about the Vietnam War. It's kind of what this is talking about. What Lincoln did is he put a little thing in there so he can get through Congress to protect a lot of the rich, wealthy merchants. That is, if you could find a substitute or you can pay $300, which is the equivalent in today's money of just over $9,000, you could be exempt from the draft. You know who didn't have the money, Mary? The poor Irish immigrants. Pretty much everybody who's an immigrant in New York yeah. City. Also, the members of the city's volunteer fire department we're going to talk about, up to that point, they were exempt from it. Guess what? Now they're not anymore. Which is but crazy because it's like well. you need your, that's like essential to your city. You need right. So, fire so they, when they, they closed that loophole. In New York City, the Enrollment Act caused more anger from its citizens than Brian Cashman does today. And that's saying <laughs> something. Right. That's how much these people were fired up and stoked up about this. The phrase rich man's war, you know, um, war a poor man's fight. That's yep. where this came from. It was repeated over and over again. Rich bankers and merchants, many of which were making money off of the blood of the war. Yes. We're not going to have to fight in it. And that was a big deal. One other thing that really got really got them bad, too, was, you know, who else was exempt from the draft? Oh, the blacks. Was, yeah. They were not eligible to serve because why? They were not citizens. Yeah. So now um, when the draft comes to New York a few months later in July of 1863, this bubbling hate caused by economic division, racism is going to boil over into the second largest insurrection in American history. Like we said, second only to the Civil War itself. Yeah. Really what it is is a perfect storm of just what the hell do we think of? Exactly. And it's been actually... You know, as you said, it's been brewing for months. But the other problem this to this is on the other side, the military side of it is that New York City is not very well defended. There's not a lot of like army men there to defend the city. And you think about it, you know, July of 1863, or you know, even going back to June, generally has come into Pennsylvania, and they need troops there. There is a man, um, his name is John E. Wool, and he's been in the Army forever. He's an 1812 veteran. He's been at the Battle of Queenston Heights in Plattsburgh, Mexican War. He trained, supplied, and commanded raw recruits at the Battle of Buena Vista. And by the second by the Civil War, he ranked second only to General Winfield Scott. So by the time of the New York City draft riots, um, he is pla- he has been placed in char- in charge of the Department of East. In New York City. And he's been there since January of 1863. And the one thing he has been trying to do is get the forts around New York manned, because right now there's not enough of them there, he feels. He's writing to Lincoln. He's writing to the governor, Horatio Seymour, and saying, we need men on these forts. And his concern is that he is worried about Confederates coming there in ships, ironclads, whatever. And they attacking New York City because he feels it is not very well defended. I don't think he was thinking when he was writing these letters that the city, that the citizens are going to turn on the city itself and riot. But John Wool has been trying, you know, for quite a few months now saying, I need men here. And he's not going to come out of this looking very good, unfortunately. But, you know, like I said, he's told the Lincoln administration, um, He's told Governor Seymour, and the one criticism of him is he's 79 years old. And that's the one thing yeah. they're saying. He's way too, he's too old, he's frail. And that's the the one criticism that comes um, out of this. And, you know, at one point he, he wrote um, L- General Lorenzo Thomas, and he said, you know, all the artillerists of the city have been sent to Harrisburg. A regiment of infantry will be forwarded today. I have asked the govern- government governor of New York to send me a regiment or less of state artillery. I have received no reply. Brigadier General Sprague um, says it will be difficult to get them at this moment. If I send you the two companies of artillery numbering 155 effective men, one shall only have 460 enlisted to man the guns of nine forts, including govern- including Governor's Island. And he's talking about these forts that are around New York. And he's saying, We're, we need the manpower here. So going into these riots, 
they don't have that kind of protection that they need from something like this. They don't. The New York militia, for the most part, was sent to Pennsylvania, like you said, to fight Gettysburg. They were all spread all over the place. So on Saturday, July 11th of 1863, this first draft is going to be held. And it's going to be held at the enrollment office in New York City on 47th and 3rd Street. Currently, in the Mary, the site of Rossman Farms, a produce wholesaler, in case you're in the area. If you want to see history while picking up a fresh tomato, that's, that's what you can do, right? So the guy running the draft is Colonel Robert Nugent, and he's an Irishman from County Down Island. And he, uh, you may remember him, Mary, he was also appointed to supervise the draft, but he was also, he was also the, the famous, the original commander mm-hmm. of the famous 69th New York, right? Yeah. The Irish Brigade. But he stepped down because in the Battle of Fredericksburg, he got shot in the stomach and he survived, but he had to be going on the sideline for a little while. So he was appointed the acting provost marshal for the Southern District of New York, which is New York City and Long Island. And since he was from an Irish Democrat, that basically the thought was the Irish immigrants would probably think, you know, maybe as one of them, he could handle it and it would probably be okay. Yeah. The Irish American newspaper in New York City, they wrote, of Nugent supervising the draft, it was a wise and popular choice. So they thought a little bit hindsight, well, maybe this will yeah. work. Now, the first day's draft pr- did go smoothly by all accounts and had no real problems. That was on a Saturday. The next day being Sunday, there was there was no there was no draft on the Sunday. Yeah. So it was going to resume again on Monday, the 13th of July. Now, that Sunday, word circulated throughout the city that the draft was going to continue the next day. So most shipyards and factories decided to close that day as basically a day of protest. Mm -hmm. They were going to shut it down. They were going to protest the Enrollment Act. That's kind of what they were going to do. do. So before the enrollment office opened on that Monday morning, a mob started to gather. And they were waiting outside for the draft to start. And when it did start and names were being picked and called out, like, like it's like the Hunger Games, right? Yeah, they're and they, but they, the person names. doing it was blindfolded because, you know, they were like, well, if we blindfold the person, and as you said, the guy doing it is a pretty, you know, he's well respected. They thought because he's Irish, like it'll be okay, but he would have been blindfolded as well while he's doing mm-hmm. it to eliminate any kind of bias. Yeah. So as they're starting to read the names, the the German and the Irish immigrants, mostly Irish, were in the crowd and they're getting more and more. It's kind of it's growing very, very yeah. uneasy. Now, Nugent, remember from that first day's draft went smoothly. He didn't think too much of it and didn't anticipate anything was going to come out of it. But all of a sudden, someone in the crowd, they do what they fire a gun. And all of a sudden, all hell broke loose. To quote Ron Burgundy, that escalated, really escalated <laughs> yes. quickly. It did. It goes from like name, like, like you said, like name calling to all of a sudden it's like rocks and bricks. And I think in in the movie Gangs of New York, it's just this brick that goes through the window. And that is what starts it off. Well, they lose it. I mean, it was just waiting, just waiting for that flashpoint. The enraged mob immediately attacks the building where the draft is being held in the ninth district provost office and uh, to stop it. And what they're going to do is they're going to, they're going to burn it to the ground after destroying all the draft paperwork and they're going to cut the telegraph wires so the authorities can't call anybody for help. That's mm-hmm. what they're going to do. Now, like you said a little while ago, New York City is very vulnerable at this point. With the fact that that state militia, like I said, is in Gettysburg, yeah. um, there's, the, the city's only defended at that moment by 1,400 local police. That's all it is. Yeah. The mob had no problem pushing through these guys. And the fire department at the time, like I mentioned, was only a volunteer one. They weren't a professional one. And part of the fire department was part of a gang called the Black Joke. Yeah, That was the name of the gang. And so when two of the members of the Black Joke heard their names called for the draft, the firemen, instead of helping put out the fires, they joined. Yeah. They said, the hell with this. We're going to do this because don't forget – they were exempt up to that point. So to hear their names, like, what the hell is going on? And they, they just lost it. So one of the policemen who did arrive at the scene, who happened to be the superintendent of the police, mm-hmm. his name was John Kennedy. Not that yeah. one, by the way, Mary. Different John Kennedy. No, I, yeah, I remember that. That's an interesting thing about this is, this, you know, the police superintendent is um, John Alexander Kennedy. And he he's going he's, he's he's to arrive Irish there. as they come. He's and, not and so in he, uniform. Right. when he arrives but the mob still recognizes him they recognize him they chase him down and beat him senseless and they take him out of commission he's done right colonel nugent 
he's going to find out what's going on at this, and he's going to be stunned. He immediately sends 32 soldiers from the invalid corps, you know, those soldiers who were slightly injured, but they, they yeah. couldn't go fight, but they had to defend. So he sends them to help out the situation. But unfortunately for them, they were also attacked, and two of those guys got killed. And basically, anyone they sent down to help quell this riot got pounded. They, they yeah. just got jumped, and they just got – just and the Donnelly Club's working them and the rocks. That's what they were doing, right? And so basically, you had an unusual small number of people trying to stop this wave of hate and anger that's been boiling for years and years and years. And once the riot got going, it didn't stop. No. After destroying the enrollment office, they looted stores. They tore up the railroad tracks. They destroyed, like I said, every DQ in the area, burnt, gone, blizzards for nobody. Yeah. And so when they started cutting those telegraph wires, and, and the words began to, to basically seek out well, what was going on was they started to seek out now the people they really wanted to get. Yeah, that was like abolitionists the, in the blacks and the Republican. They went after Republican newspapers right, as well. They actually went after the Bulls Head Hotel as well and burned it down because guess what? They would not serve uh, alcohol to the rioters. They would. They wouldn't give. The, they like, wouldn't no. give the drunken riot, rioters already more alcohol, so they, they burnt the place down. But what that's what happens is it turns into the, it turns on the movie The Purge is what mm -hmm. it kind of does. They're going to start hunting down Republicans slash abolitionists, and they're going to hunt down blacks. And they, yeah. They're going to they're going to hunt them right. So the Republican, you know, Horace Greeley, you know, his New York Tribune, his newspaper office, his Republican newspaper was targeted, in they actually saved the building the employees did because somehow they had Gatling guns and they pulled them out and they said, nope, and they walked away. Yeah. How many newspapers have Gatling guns? Yeah, like but what that's, a brilliant... But that's what they did. And, but they like, um, and Horace Greeley was there listening to bulletins on the Telegraph before the wires were cut of what was happening in the city. So they knew they were on their way. To... Just so you know, Mary, it wasn't just men causing these problems. It was no. women too. Exactly. And there's a, there's a quote that described the women as, ferociously swinging aprons and handkerchiefs while cheering and urging the rioters forward yep. right so it, it was everybody george templeton strong he's got a very famous diary he's kind mm -hmm. of a northern version of mary chestnut he was a rich new yorker who happened to pay that 300 dollars thing to get out of it by yep. the way he wrote of these 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 rioters he called them the beastly ruffians our masters of the situation of the city now, what's funny, by, by the way, speaking uh, speaking of uh, George Templeton Strong, you know, he, he you know he wrote in his diary of paying the fee to get out of it. He, he yeah. wrote, I paid a big old Dutch boy of about 20 years old to be my alter ego. I mean, you kind of kind of realize why they hated these people. Yeah, right? like it is really like it's definitely like rich man's war, poor man's fight kind of thing, right? Like here he is writing about like, oh, I pay, I was able to pay someone off. And like, it's totally like the war is not really touching them at uh, up to that point, right? Yeah. But now they have to face it with these riots. Mm -hmm. and you mentioned Wool earlier. So, but one other guy who helped who, who from the army who did arrive, another old dude, a 67 year old uh, guy from Rahway, New Jersey and a veteran of the Mexican war, a guy named General Harvey Brown. Mm -hmm. And he was also part of that New York Harbor um, leadership yeah. over there. And Brown, he's going to arrive at the police headquarters and sort of help out. But what he kind of does is add a sense of calm. Yeah. Because Thomas Acton, you know, he replaced John Kennedy. So he's the police chief and he's kind of bouncing off the walls, kind of like, oh, Howard over there. At the, you yeah. Know, that's, cemetery cemetery. Camp, right? <laughs> that's kind of kind of what he was. But what, what, um, what Brown does is, is kind of settle him down. And so, as I said earlier, the mob is going to start uh, start basically targeting these African Americans, yep. and there was probably about twelve thousand blacks in the city at the time. They were spread all over the place. Yeah, and so a boot four p.m. on that first day, a mob of four hundred gathered outside the Colored Orphan Asylum on Fifth Avenue near Forty Third Street. Yeah, many carried torches. They chanted "Burn the ends nest" as yep. they were doing it, and they torched the building. Inside the building was 223 black children. Yeah. Now, fortunately, um, they were led out of the building yeah. from the, the Savannah out by, by ironically, <laughs> by, a, by a, a young Irish kid named Patty McCurfty. And sadly, one child did die who tried to hide under the bed. Oh. He didn't make yeah. it. He died in the burn. But it's a miracle, actually, that that it didn't. It was not yeah. worse. It really, really was.
Yeah, it, it's the, you know, this first day is probably the worst day of these riots. I mean, all the days are are bad. Um, but, you know, as you said, like, you know, at the Midtown docks, the tensions have been blue. They've, they've been brewing there for quite a while, like years and years and years. And then that spills over down there as, as well. Um, in that area, like the, the dock workers are destroying like brothels, dance halls, boarding houses, tenements, um, all that, especially the ones that cater to the African-Americans. Right. And, you know, the, they're even going after the white owners of these businesses. So I guess the people that they would see as being the abolitionists. Um, but it's like, it just keeps kind of steamrolling and more and more people are joining into it as well. And because the telegraph wires are being cut, they can't really get word out about what's happening no it's the day goes on night does fall and sort of fortunately the city was hit by an intense rainstorm that night yeah that put did put out a lot of the fires but not all of them so when the sun came up on tuesday july 14th there was still fires burning in the city that day is going to continue and bring more riots and they got more and more intense and more and more deadly and yeah. made base but a lot of the, a lot of the first day's participants stop they would they kind of went went back to work yeah because the second day like you know the the day one you have like the irish and german immigrants native-born americans taking to the streets um you know the volunteer fire department is involved um on day two you have um like irish cartman quarrymen street pavers as well as the workers who were again the dock workers are going into the mob again as well railway yards and foundries are involved on day two, which is um, Tuesday, would be Tuesday, July 14th. Um, and as you said, there is a heavy rain that that falls. And on, so for the first day, Governor Horatio Seymour is nowhere to be found. Um, and he had given a speech on July the 4th that kind of hinted at, you know, like just saying, like, look at what's happening, like with these drafts, like the government doesn't care about you. He's openly criticizing Lincoln. And that also he says the draft is unconstitutional. That's what yeah, he says. Yeah, and he's fueling, he was one of the ones fueling this. He's nowhere to be found on Monday, July the 13th. But Tuesday, July the 14th, um, he does arrive and he speaks at, at City Hall where he does try and, you know, then this is where he says, like, you know, the con this conscription act is unconstitutional. And um, this is when General Johnny e. Wool, he does bring... Um, some soldiers and Marines in from the forts at New York Harbor, West Point and Brooklyn Navy Yard. Um, and wow. this is when he orders, you know, he's sending, you know, Lincoln administration, anybody he can. He's sending uh, telegrams out saying you need to send these militias back because we need them here. He does. Hor Horatio, you know, he, Seymour, he's an interesting guy, too, because, you know, he yeah. he uses the moment to politicize. Yes. And he blames the Republicans for it. Ironically, he'll run and lose against U.S. grants for the White House a couple mm -hmm. of years later. Yeah. But that but that second day, though, you know, they the, they continued to target the blacks, and and there were set, there are a lot of really bad stories about what happened on this day. But it's important to tell them because it adds context to the yeah. entire thing. So you know, there was a, a black guy. His name was Jeremiah Ro Jeremiah Robinson. He tried to escape the city to Brooklyn by wearing his wife's clothes, right? And but he was discovered and was murdered by the mob right in front of, right in front of his wife, right? Yeah. And William Jones, he was another escaping black. He was killed and he was left to rot in the streets after he was attacked after going to the store to buy bread for his family. Yeah. And that's how and they identified him bought his body was because he had the bread. Because he had bread under his arm. That's how they yep. found him. There was a black woman who testified that the mob broke into her house on East uh, 28th Street and literally threw the baby out the window. Mm -hmm. um, when when asked if any other blacks were in, were in that building, she told them that they were hiding in the basement. So you know what they did? They broke the water pipes, locked the doors, and drowned them in the basement, flooded the, the basement. Oh the, the, most of these stories come from a book called Vol – it's called Volcano yeah. Under the City, right? It was got William Osborne – Stoddard. It was the 1880s. So some of these stories you're going to take with a grain of salt, but 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 that's what they were talking about. Uh, all day, you know, most blacks remained in the city, um, or I mean, in hiding in the city rather, as the mob continued to hunt them down. They were also looking for wealthy people too. 
they would yell down with the rich. And if they yeah. saw, if they saw a guy dress well, they'd yell, there's a $300 man. And they, and they, when they chanted, and they found one, when they did find a guy who, who had some money, they beat the hell out of him. Yeah. And, and so the, these burnings continued throughout the second day, the mob actually came upon something called the union steamworks, which inside of it was filled with rifles and ammunition. But fortunately, before the mob got inside, the cops got there and took all that stuff out. But um, you mentioned before, the use, at this point, slowly but surely, you're going to start to see troops coming into the city. Yeah. And more, more help came. There's 150 basically green recruits from the 11th New York Volunteer Infantry. And they showed up under the command of uh, Colonel Henry O'Brien, mm-hmm. along, with, you know, along with 200 police. O'Brien's men loaded two cannon full of blanks and fired on the crowd and also told the men to fire their rifles in the air. Just yeah. put a scare in these rifles. Yeah, just to, they're just to kind of, because they don't, you know, it's like, they probably don't want to kill people, right? Because But guess what happens? People die. They kill two boys on the roof yep. watching. Yeah. And that that fires them up too. When the rioters found out O'Brien was in charge, they went and they found him. And about two o'clock in the afternoon, he was discovered by a mob of men and he was tortured to death in fr- right in front of right in front of everybody. They just yep. tortured him and killed him. Now, by now, those politicians were, like you said, were in complete spin control. And Seymour didn't help. He really didn't. He, no, because he he's going there to kind finger. of incite that, you know, he's inciting things more. And it's like he shows up. He's not there the first day. And then he shows up on the second day, says the draft is unconstitutional, yeah. which is not going to help any he's, at all. He's not even a West Pointer. He's here for, no. he's here for the votes. <laughs> That's kind of what he was. Yeah. You know, he was there basically for trying to fire up the mob and blaming the, the other the abolitionists, the Republicans, as well as the peace Democrats. They're trying to blame everybody. Um, New York's mayor, like you said, a guy named um, George Updike, he is going to get a hold of Stanton and wire and say, send guys, we need guys. Yeah. And those 4,000 guys do finally get there. Those guys from Gettysburg and West Point and some other mm-hmm. guys all kind of come down there uh, after a forced march. But what was it? One of the regiments, this is fascinating to me. One of the regiments that actually went, it was forced march from Gettysburg, was the 27th Indiana under Colonel yeah. Silas Cosgrove. Now, these were the guys two weeks before who lost a third of their men charging Lower Culp's Hill with a second mass yep. uh, on early July 3rd. And now they had to go to freaking New York City to put down this riot. Could I mean, you was, imagine, was, like, being in that, like, it's like, okay, you just went through this terrible battle, and then it's like, okay, now we got to go to New York City because the people are not happy there and they're rioting. Yeah, it just there's no rest for the weary. The 65th and 74th New York National Guard they're going to arrive, and their soldiers, for the most part, are Irish. Mm-hmm. But they had no sympathy towards their Irish brethren ripping up the city. Sergeant Peter Welsh, he's of the 28th Massachusetts, and the Irish Brigade, he's a carpenter from New York City, and he just got back. He just finished fighting the Battle of Gettysburg, and he's going to write to his wife, I have read of the disgraceful draft riots, and the, consp- uh, and the conspirators should be hung like dogs, and authorities should use canister freely on these bloody cutthroats. So it wasn't like this was this was a you know Irish kind of jumping on board. They they wanted this thing stopped. Yeah. So despite this military presence, the attacks on blacks continued. Yeah. Houses are broken into, and, and, and being searched by the mob. And the Landlords rioting like, is spreading as well too. You know, I think it, to begin it's on in Manhattan, right? Um, con- New York, but New York then City it starts- at that point went about as far as the north side of Central Park at that point. That, that's yeah. kind of where that area went. So everything below there, it spread throughout the city. But then it White starts Le- to spread to Brooklyn and Stanton Island. Right. Right. Staten Island. So, so, Stat- so yeah, what Staten happens, Island. Yeah. So what, what happens is, is the white landlords are going to start kicking me to get out of here because I don't want mm-hmm. my house burnt down. And, you know, basically there's that, there's that story. Um, there's a story that we, we're going to talk about is the, about Abraham Franklin, right? He's, mm-hmm. a, he's a 23-year-old guy. He's a black guy. And he is going to go to church to pray with his mother for their safety because she's nervous. So they're going to go to church together. The mob is going to break in and tear him, bring him outside, and they're going to drag him up the street, and they're going to lynch him from a lamppost right in front of her house on 33rd Avenue. The thing about it, though, with this story is it gets worse with this guy. Yeah, A 16-year-old Irish kid named Patrick Butler, okay, He's going to cut Franklin's dead body down. 
he's going to remove his pants and drag the dead Franklin up and down the street from his genitals and <gasps> drag him as the crowd cheers and laughs. That's what this riot was. All while his mother can see it happening too. And, right. Can you imagine? There's, I mean, it's just, I mean, at this point, at the end, at the end of the day, it, it, it was it was mayhem. The yeah. mob gathered um, East 19th Street. There was a military gathered there, so the mob kind of attacked them. At this point, the troops are going to unlimber cannon, and they're going to begin to fire grape shot right into the crowd, while citizens in nearby windows are armed with pistols firing upon them. At that point, the troops say, let's get the hell out of here. Yeah. But they're also ordered to return and hunt down these sharpshooters unmercifully. Um, and, and use canister freely on these people. Now remember, this is in the streets of New York City, yeah. where the military is fighting the citizens, and no one knows about it historically. No. It was just, and it's it happening just, in and too. It's happening in a northern city as well, and it's right. just and, how divided even some of these places in the north were. And this is after the after the the, the victories of Vicksburg and Gettysburg, yeah. and things were kind of looking up. But this is happening in, a, in an American city, which is just uh, un, it's unfathomable to yeah, think about. Yeah, it's crazy. And you, it's on Wednesday, July the 15th, that um, Robert Nugent, he receives word from his superior officer, you know, let's postpone the draft. Well, they're smart. They, they realize they're going to slow this yeah, it's thing like, down. Because it's like, maybe more, let's just postpone it. More Union regiments are arriving in the city, and by nightfall, it does seem like the riot's waning a little bit. I mean, not yeah. really, but it sort of seems like it is. As a matter of fact, Mayor Opdyke, he's going to issue a proclamation saying the riot's over. But he came across like Mayor Larry Vaughn from Amityville dismissing the shark problem. Okay. Is kind of how he came across when he did that. And jump ahead on a Thursday, July 16th, right? Yeah. Basically, it came in New York City, did begin to return to normal at this point. It, it really was slowing down. The streetcars were reopened. Mm -hmm. All the telegraph lines were repaired. Blacks began to feel like they could walk the streets again, but there was also a heavy police and military presence yeah. to protect them. But sporadic violence did pop. It did happen yeah. from time to time, but it did feel like it did slow down. But when the violence broke out, there was one rioter who was heard to say, better to die at home than to die in Virginia. Yeah, that was kind of the, the mentality of what was going on with this. Yeah, there was so, northerners with that mentality because they are so far removed from what's happening. And they, you know, it's like the in the movie Copperhead, which is an excellent movie. You know, the attitude is, why should I care about what's going on in Virginia if I live in New York State? Yeah, exactly. And when it's all said and done, the death totals are inconclusive. Even today, yeah. no one really knows. Mo most historians put the death number to around 120. Uh, basically, only t out of those 120, 12, there was only 12 of, of African Americans who were in the, who were killed, and the rest were uh, were the rioters. But there, the, the, the problem is, no one really knows because there no. were some bodies that were just thrown in the river. Um, there was one that was thrown on the ground and burnt into ashes because they wanted they didn't never wanted to see him in the neighborhood again. Yeah. So they, they destroyed his body. Oh my god! Um, there was some there were some families who buried their buried them in the backyard just never said so there's no one really knows i mean no it, it's 120 is, is the accepted number but they, i wouldn't be surprised if it was much much higher. they say there's more and you know the damage was in the millions upon millions of dollars so like at the time during the civil war so we're talking 1863 dollars it's one to five million dollars which today is you know seven you know 17.6 million maybe upwards of even as high as 88.2 million dollars in damage is done during these riots um, i mean this was this dollars. was this was not a tuesday night in goderich average <laughs> street fight mary but this this was this was a full metal jacket cluster yeah. situation that went over four days now in the city republicans they wanted to, they wanted to basically want several peace democrats to be arrested for conspiracy and but lincoln decided you know let's leave those decisions up to the locals i don't want i don't yeah. want to touch this he wanted nothing to do with it so since the rioters are mostly irish democrats and the democrats were needed the irish votes what happened they basically got off scot free yeah. including the people who killed you know a lot a lot of these people yeah um that they know about and so basically for the most part guys like abraham franklin the guy who was 
killed and mutilated and dragged up the street. His death went unpunished because they weren't going to prosecute people who they needed for the votes. And that that's one of the ugliest situations. Yeah, it, 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 it's such a, you know, there's a lot of ugly things that are happening in this part of the Civil War that's not talked about very much. And they do resume the draft on August the 19th. And it was completed within ten days without further incident. Incident. Well, at they, all. They, they, they did. They did. But but it, what this kind of thing? It really added a lot of political power for the war Democrats in New York City. Yeah. It rose. You know, guy William Tweed, the guy they called Boss Tweed. He kind of rose from this, and he's supported by the Irish by Tammany Hall. They blame the Peace Democrats for the insurrection. And it helped consolidate all their power in the in New York City mm-hmm. and create that that continuing monstrous political monster that is Tammany Hall. Now, when the last fire was put out, the last shot was was fired. You know, New York City was able to put itself back together again. And very similar to 9/11, the community actually kind of came together. They did to help everybody. There was a black newspaper. It was called the Anglo African. They wrote about where blacks could get aid. And on, the, and on July 25th, they announced the formation of a committee of merchants. Now, this was this was a new charity organized by white, wealthy New Yorkers to do what? To help assist black victims of mm. these riots. The committee of merchants helped raise and give money to several black businesses, like a guy named Albro Lyons. He was a black merchant who ran a ship outfitting company, and the, his entire business was destroyed in the riot. He received $2,000 from this group, which is a lot of money. Yeah. Dollar, a lot of money, right? That, that's kind of how it was, right? Funds were basically raised to rebuild that orphanage that was burnt down. Yep. After, and uh, like a lot of the other sites of violence. But despite all this, uh, many black residents that fled Manhattan, they never returned. Yeah, 20% Manhattan, of them flee the city. Right. And they went further north of the island to settle the area, which is now known as Harlem. Yeah. And a lot of them went to Brooklyn. And so if you go to New York City in today's areas, those towns, that those parts of New York City are very heavy African-American. And that's directly because of these draft riots Yeah, is what is what drove them all there. Now, like to what you said, the draft did resume on August 19th. It was it was protected by 20,000 soldiers. So there wasn't like much could really happen. But really, the, the, the whole we talked about this earlier, the whole draft concept really fizzled and fell apart. Yeah. The primary reason, like we said before, the draft existed to fill in that gap between the volunteers and the quotas. But the, the problem is the, vol- the good thing, I guess, is the volunteer numbers really increased. And the reason why is because is of who? It was because of 180,000 black volunteers yep. who now could join the Emancipation Proclamation. So it's ironically, at the end of the day, the black soldiers who would ironically, they would take the spots of the immigrants who couldn't afford to pay the $300 yeah. because so the draft became a, a moot point. They they attacked blacks because they they couldn't serve and they had to serve. At the end of the day, they ultimately did not have to serve because these blacks signed up to join, yeah. which is kind of one of those weird historical ironies. Yeah, it's, it's interesting how, it, how it, it's, it works out, right? Yeah, it just was me. Colonel Robert Nugent, he's going to survive all this. And he's going to be, he's that superintendent of the 69th Mm -hmm. New York we talked about. He's going to be heavily involved in recruiting. 1864, he's going to continue to recruit white soldiers in his Irish brigade. And he will go on to become the Irish brigade's final commander. He will actually have the honor of leading that brigade at the Grand Review in Washington in May of 1865 when the war is over, right? So at the end of the day, when you think about it, most of the rioters, basically were Irish. And when the people they were stopping them were also Irish. So really, when you think about the New York draft riots, it's sometimes referred to as the Irish Civil War mm-hmm. in New York City. And yeah. it kind of was. If you yeah, it's its own it. it's because it shows how divided um, things were in the city. You know, and you have to remember the, the things that are factoring into this are, you know, the, the Copperhead politicians like Fernando Wood, Horatio Seymour, and just as well as the media is inciting some of this as well, you know, and the draft law, the, the draft law, which, you know, for me, my, my opinion is it was not one of Link, the Lincoln administration's best moves, I think, just because they were kind of like, they just put it in place and didn't think of, you know, well, what might happen kind of thing. And then, you know, this is what happened from it. 
No, it, it, yeah. it, 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 at the end of the day, what the New York draft riots really were, it, it, you know, it, it just showed that racism and fear of others is not a regional thing. And Northern racism was just as strong as Southern racism. Exactly. And the, and the story of, the, of the, the draft riot is certainly one of the darkest in American history. But basically what it did was it helped. It, it basically showed what happens when politicians and the media can go out of their way to fire up people who are already feeling depressed and angry and blaming somebody else. And then a flash happens and ignites it. And that's what happens. Now, who knows how many ultimately died, but the damage was done. And like we said at the beginning of this, the fingerprints are still in New York City from the draft. Oh, yeah. Where, where people are sitting outside drinking at these outdoor cafes on Fifth Avenue, where, where, where black men were lynched and where Irish guys were shot down by American soldiers. So it's an ugly part of history. So if you if you really are fascinated by it, uh, there are a lot of good books to read about this that we mm-hmm. mentioned before. A City Under the Volcano, I mentioned, is probably the best one. But at the but really, what it does, it just it puts a, it shines a light on that problem this country had at that time. And Lincoln, you're right. Lincoln's draft was a folly in a lot of different ways. It yeah. was really unnecessary, and the way it was done. You can tell by putting guy a guy like Robert Nugent in charge, they thought something could happen. Yeah. And if you think something could happen, maybe you just shouldn't do it. Yeah. Right? And to the fact that they're not listening to Wool because, you know, the whole ageism thing is playing against him. They're not listening to like, hey, we need to have more people here. Now, again, it's not because uh, General Wool thinks there's going to be a... Um, a riot he thinks that the confederates are going to come up into new york harbor and basically bomb the shit out of the city that's what his fear was and nobody listened to him um general bull ultimately does become a scapegoat um in the new york city draft riots again because of his age but you know he was said to you know be very frail and just not able to command or whatever but mean but you know his um i read an article about him and it was really interesting basically saying like you know we need to reassess this guy's role and understand that um you know he did play a role in the over a role in the overall civil aspects of the civil war he's involved in the peninsula campaign as well um but you know he's a veteran of the war of 1812 he's involved in the mexican war and again he's second you know in rank to general winfield scott when the civil war breaks out um And interesting fact, he's buried in the same cemetery as General George Henry Thomas. Oh, wow. that's pretty cool. Yeah, that's pretty cool. But yeah, he he just has this, you know, we see this so much and, and we've talked about it a lot in these episodes that there always has to be like a scapegoat or there sometimes seems to be. And that's kind of where General Wool comes in here. He's like this scapegoat for what happens during the riots. But obviously it's not just him that's involved. Um, there's so many different factors playing into these draft riots and they are a very, very dark part of not just the civil war but american history and i think it's a part that needs to be looked at more because it's showing what is going on on the home front and just how divided uh things were in the north and two that racism is terrible in the north just as much as it is in the south and right especially yeah. especially when it's coupled with with the economic factor as yeah, well exactly and, and and the fact that you know um, you're, you're merging the two together to come up with the, the you know, for many, many scapegoats. And the fact that this, the reason why this, you're failing is because of this guy. You're yeah. living in, you're living in these, these real tough neighborhoods. Your, your job is 16 hour days. Um, and now you know, now you have to worry about someone taking your job and you've got the politicians, and the newspapers fanning the flames. I mean, truth, truth be told, it, it's really a story that should be told more. Yeah. Um, because it's it's a it's a lesson that we can still learn today. So so I think that's a good point to drop off yep. here. I think that's that's a, that's certainly a, a story well told. So so definitely check out some check out some literature on that uh, and, and read about this. For people listen to this because it's something that just it's it's almost like you read this and it's almost like it's a it's a fiction. You realize it really happened yeah. here in, in that in, um in how much uh, how close the city came to just tearing itself apart. And at the time, things were going well here in the East, in, 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 in the war. Yeah. You so- have to think that, you know, Vicksburg has happened, Gettysburg, it's two victories for the okay. Union, you know, and it's, you know, there's this part of the, the war that is basically, I don't want to say it's being ignored, but it's not really talked about. It's overshadowed by everything else. And yes, it is an ugly part of the history. But when you study history, you have to study the ugly parts 
of it too. And this is definitely one of those. And, you know, if you haven't seen Gangs in New York or it's been a while since you've watched it, definitely watch it. Again, take a lot of it with a grain of salt. It's not 100% historically accurate like anything, but it is a good um, Civil War movie about what is going on at the home front in New York City. And near the end, they do the riots and they it's pretty graphic. Um, yeah, it's show. just that the, the, the long term bubbling hatred exploded yeah. in those four days in July of 1863. So it's a it's a history that really, really needs to be studied. So what's coming up for us next? What's next? So our next episode, hopefully dropping next week, if not um, the week after, just depending on our schedules and stuff, uh, we will be talking about the Battle of the Crater, which, again, not a great day for the Union Army or General Burnside. Nope, nope. It's, it's going to be another tough one, but it's a good story to tell. I mean, people who uh, study Petersburg know the story of the creator with Ledley and, and Burnside and the USCT soldiers and everything that went on that. So so we'll get back to battles. We'll talk about that. So we have our live coming up this weekend, I believe. Right? On Sunday, Sunday at 10 a.m. On Check out our YouTube channel, subscribe to us, and you can join us for our live streams that we have on there. Um, it's always a good time. We just, you know, usually talk about the episode but and uh-huh. if you've been on our lives you know that we bounce from subject to subject in the civil war so we kind of go all and over def- the place and also watch the spot too but we'll be announced in the book club with maine at gettysburg yeah that'll be coming here pretty soon too so all right so off we go any final words from you finch Drew? oh well thanks for bringing it as you always do and um again huge thank you to our listeners Oh, there's Funko Mary. <laughs> Huge thank you to our listeners. We reached 175,000 downloads uh, last week. Um, so thank you for everybody for supporting us for these near three years. We couldn't have done it without you guys, and you are all awesome, and we really appreciate the support. Definitely a lot of fun, a lot of fun. All right, so everybody have a great week, and hope it cools off where you are. It is brutally hot yeah, in, this, in this country. So get some, grab, a, grab a libation, sit outside. Hopefully you get a little bit of breeze, get some thunderstorms to cool off the world, and off we go. All right, Mary, it's a pleasure as always. To, you know, pleasure is always all yours, and we'll look forward to talking to you all on the other side. See you all later. Bye. Bye, guys. <laughs>